Stimulant by user Randy Romero. Ronnie would have complained about the accommodations, but what accommodations? The marquee outside boasted color TV and free HBO, and as far as Ronnie could tell, that was all the Starlight Inn had to offer. There were no additional amenities. No pool, no gym, no room service. Not even a mint on his pillow. But what did Ronnie expect for $65 a night? This place was the very definition of no frills. Harry, you cheap bastard, Ronnie thought. You couldn't even book me a room at a Marriott or a hotel inn. Even the Motel 6 down the road seemed like the Ritz-Carlton compared to this dump. There was a twin bed, a small TV with basic cable, a writing desk with a cheap hotel stationery, and a nightstand with a landline. Ronnie hadn't seen a corded phone since the 90s. It was a relic from the past that he could hardly recall. Drugs and alcohol tend to take a toll on your memories. He lit a cigarette and took another look over the room, the unremarkable beige wallpaper that would have looked more at home in his grandmother's living room the predictable floral pattern carpeting, the comforter, bed sheets, and pillowcases all carried an anchored stench of bleach. The carpet was stained and frayed and riddled with cigarette burns. The wallpaper was cracked and peeling in certain spots. The light fixtures were dust-coated, and the light itself was dull and barely illuminated the whole room. Above the television, a banal painting of a sailboat. Ronnie wondered how much that must have set the place back. The bed itself was lumpy, Awkward and unpleasant. Ronnie lay down for two minutes to test it out, and immediately came to the conclusion that he'd be better off sleeping on the floor. But he wasn't about to rest his face anywhere near that grimy carpet, so the bed would have to suffice for the evening. One thing he didn't mind was the exclusion of a mini bar. That was about all he was grateful for. Sometimes it was difficult for Ronnie to resist the temptation to imbibe. Sobriety was a constant struggle for him. He'd requested a smoking room, and they couldn't even be troubled to supply him with an ashtray. But that wasn't going to stop Ronnie from smoking, so he resorted to using the bathroom sink. Ronnie Wright, the once rich and famous lead singer and guitarist of Right and Wrong, was now relegated to performing solo gigs in smaller venues like bars, VFW halls, and street fairs. He went from sold-out concerts to drawing flies in dive bars, from five-star hotels to roach motels. Of course, Ronnie Wright was just a stage name, a pseudonym. Ronald Dowles was the loving handle his parents gave him, but he never had much use for it. Ronnie Wright was the name he preferred. Ronald Dowles was a nobody, a bum, who would have ended up pumping gas for a living or selling dope in a dark, dirty alley. Ronnie Wright was a rock star, a legend, a god, in his own words. Ronnie stood in the bathroom taking drags from a cigarette and tapping the ash into the dingy sink, the porcelain discolored and stained from God only knows what. His family and friends had begged and pleaded with him to quit smoking, but smoking was the least of Ronnie's issues. He clashed with addiction his whole life. It came with the music industry. If you could smoke it, snort it, shoot it, or swallow it, Ronnie was doing it. Coke, crack, heroin, ecstasy, painkillers, speed. Meth was a bitch of the bunch. One bump was all it took to reel him in like a live fish, but the drugs carried him through his gigs, kept him going on stage, and kept him on the road for 250 days out of the year. At the height of his career, Ronnie took everything he could get his hands on. He played guitar on acid, drunk off his ass, high on coke, tweaked out of his mind on crystal meth. He smoked joints after the shows, or took painkillers just so he could sleep. In fact, Ronnie hardly remembered the height of his career. So many gigs, so many venues, so many blurred faces and faded memories. But he cleaned up his act over the years. Caffeine and nicotine were his only vices now. No more drinking, no more drugs. But he needed the caffeine to perform on stage. Uppers were out of the question. Caffeine and sugar were his only options. He finished the cigarette and flicked it into the toilet. He washed his hands and dried them off with a coarse towel that reeked of bleach. Then, he consulted the magic eight ball in his duffel bag. The eight ball was a gift that a fan had given him one night after a gig in Kansas City, Kansas. Or, was it Kansas City, Missouri? Ronnie honestly couldn't remember. 
but it didn't matter. That eight ball had been with him for years, and it went wherever Ronnie traveled. Will the show go off without a hitch tonight? He asked and gave it a shake. Definitely yes, was the eight ball's answer. Will I be bringing a groupie back to my room tonight? He gave the eight ball another shake. Signs pointed yes, was its response. Should Harry Fletcher eat a bowl of dicks? Without a doubt, the eight ball replied. Harry Fletcher was Ronnie's agent and manager, all rolled into one. He booked all of Ronnie's solo gigs, negotiated his contracts and fees, guided him to new opportunities, and was responsible for all of Ronnie's accommodations. Hence the hellhole of a hotel he'd stuck Ronnie in. Ronnie set the eight ball down on the bed and went back to his duffel bag. Ravensville was a small Pennsylvania town, with only one gas station on your way in and out. He'd stopped off for a pack of smokes and to load up on coffee and sugary drinks. The shelves of the fridge were stocked with off-brand cola. No Coca-Cola or Pepsi. No name brands. They didn't have Sprite, but they had Spirit. No Dr. Pepper, but they had Dr. Spice. Instead of Mountain Dew, there was Mountain Mist. No Coke but they had Jazz Cola. According to the label, Jazz Cola contained three times the amount of caffeine of regular sodas. It also clearly stated that the drink was not approved by the FDA. Go figure. He popped the top of the can, sat on the bed, and flipped through the TV channels. All 22 of them. The rest were scrambled, and Ronnie could barely make out the picture. There were a few adult films available to rent, which Ronnie considered purchasing and sticking Harry with the bill. The news was on Channel 4, which is what he settled for, but Ronnie was only half listening. To Ronnie, no news was good news. Terrorist attacks, nuclear weaponry, school shootings. Bad news waited around every corner. You don't even have time to digest one story before they hit you with the next wave of tragedy or senseless violence. He waited for the bubbles in the can to settle, then he took a taste test. It wasn't Coke or Pepsi. It wasn't even Royal Crown, but it had a sweet aftertaste that Ronnie couldn't deny. He took another sip and found it was even better the second time around. He took a bigger gulp and fished out a cigarette from his pack. He lit it and held it between his coarse, calloused fingers. Guitar strings are not very kind on your fingers, and he vehemently refused to use a pick. The day he used a pick, he traded in his man card. Picks are for sissies, Ronnie thought. Actually, sissy wasn't really the word he was thinking of. You get the drift. A real guitarist plays with his fingers. That was his belief, and there was no room for debate. He took one last swig of his soda and encountered a mysterious residue at the bottom of the can. The viscous substance slid down his throat before he even had a chance to react. He managed to spit out only a drop of the gray sludge that splattered against the beige wallpaper. He retched and gagged from the taste. He tried to force it back up, but the slimy substance wouldn't budge. The cigarette slipped from his fingers, but Ronnie had enough sense to stomp it out with the shoe before it set the carpet ablaze. Still choking on whatever he had accidentally ingested, he rushed to the bathroom and jammed one finger down his throat. He coughed and heaved, half of the foreign substance in his stomach, the other half lodged in his throat. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't throw it back up. Crouched over the toilet, Ronnie finally managed to dislodge the thick, gray sludge from his throat. It plopped in the toilet with a heavy splash. Ronnie had never seen anything like it before, but whatever it was, it was moving, crawling around inside the toilet, trying desperately to escape. Oh no, you don't, Ronnie said, and he slammed down the lid and flushed the toilet. He sat down at the foot of the bed, catching his breath. He scratched at his suddenly itchy, irritated throat. The enamelous substance kicked around in his stomach, wreaking havoc on his insides. Am I going to be okay? he asked shaking the magic eight ball. Ask again later. Unsatisfied with the response, Ronnie tried again. Am I going to be all right? Very doubtful. Frustrated, he tossed the eight ball aside. Then he clutched at his stomach, the pain excruciating and almost indescribable. He'd never felt pain like this before in his life. He went to retrieve his phone from his duffel bag, but only made it two steps before the pain incapacitated him. He plunged to his knees, cradling his belly with both hands. He could feel this substance, this thing, shifting around in the pit of his stomach, twisting, turning, tearing 
at its insides. It was spreading, growing, as malignant as a tumor. It wasn't just confined to his stomach anymore. It was everywhere. He could feel it binding with his blood, ripping at his flesh, eating through his bones like corrosive acid. What's happening to me? Ronnie asked, breathing laboriously. Am I going to make it through this? They all tumbled off the bed, and Ronnie saw its ominous message. Outlook, not so good. Doubled over in pain, he managed to crawl his way past the useless eight ball towards his duffel bag, where his phone was. He needed immediate medical attention. Come on, you're almost there, Ronnie thought, trying to will himself on. The pain was insufferable. He was getting weaker, losing the fight. You're so close. Just a few more feet. Just a few more... Harry Fletcher arrived an hour before the gig to protect his investment. As both his agent and manager, he had a vested interest in Ronnie's performances, and he knew how unreliable musicians could be. Harry was a veteran in the music industry. He dealt with the best, and he dealt with the worst. He still wasn't sure where Ronnie ranked. Room 14. That's where the receptionist told Harry he could find Ronnie. He knocked once. Waited a moment. Then knocked again. Ronnie! It's me, Harry shouted. Open up. You don't want to be late. Promoters hate that shit. He tried the knob. The door wasn't locked, but something stopped him from going in. He watched as a gray puddle seeped out from under the door. Slimy and viscous. An unidentifiable substance. Unlike anything Harry had ever seen. Harry wasn't entirely sure he wanted to see what was waiting on the other side of that door. But he drew a deep breath braced himself, and grabbed hold of the doorknob. 